Sure, I'll even put my coffee away like I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I think, oh, I turned my mic on. It did work. That's, I've never been mic'd before in my life. So this is a new experience for me. And I don't know how I feel about hearing my voice this high pitched and everywhere. So, uh, um, so, well, isn't that special? Cataloging in special formats in Evergreen. Um, who knows what that is a reference to? Okay, awesome. I didn't know. I, I actually didn't put the picture of what it was from in, but I figured if you got it, you got it. If you didn't, you would ask. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll do it from here. Okay. Well, isn't that special? There we go. Okay. Okay. So a little about me. Um, I've been a librarian for about 10 plus years. I don't even know at this point. Um, I got my MLS from Mizzou. So M-I-Z, if you know, you know. Um, I have a background in mostly cataloging, but accidentally, as, as my flow chart shows below, I started at St. Louis Public Library um, as actually a lower level technical services person putting on security strips for about a year um, while I did my MLS. Um, then I went to an evergreen library as a director for a flash and pan shout out to if you do that because I'm nine months there and then I jumped into academia, where I was forcibly made to do electronic resources and some managing of that, and then I came back to Missouri evergreen so feels like home. Um, this is Gibbs I have to do a shameless plug that's my corgi um, he's basically my coworker since I work from home. So okay what are we going to talk about today we're going to talk about a little bit of everything there's so much involved in special is no way to touch everything so there are going to be whole swaths of information I don't even touch on in this presentation. But we're going to talk a little bit about resource description in general in evergreen because that will come into play later we're going to talk about uh, formats of bib records and the rules. Um, whether those can be massaged or um, how do you create templates for bib records um, should you and what that looks like once it happens. And then we're going to touch on at the end of icons, because as we all know, uh, the icons are controlled right by your bib records and the templates all the icons. So it would be remiss if we didn't mention that because it's very important. Okay, so cataloging. Uh, resource description in Missouri Evergreen. Um, it's a learning curve for catalogers if you are used to specifically, a lot of people get trained in like OCLC. So if they're used to something like that, very like standardized, it works a certain way, bad in any way. In fact, there are like some really great things about it. But if you happen to have to train catalogers, talking them off the ledge of, oh my, that looks completely different. And I don't know how to do that. If you're not cataloging outside and then coming inside just in Evergreen. Um, but the pros, the things I like the most, the editor choices, um, I flip back and forth, right? You have the flat text editor and you have the enhanced editor. I flip back and forth all the time between those because like my 245s, 300s, whatever in flat text, and then I will do enhanced and then use the wizard for maybe an 07, right? So you have the best of both worlds in that case. And then of course, uh, you have your mark view tab, which is nice. And then I view, but it is a hunt in a peck and 500 clicks to get there. And Evergreen has the button right there and it pops up a new window and you can see what it looks like for your patron, which is very, very important, right? Okay, so more on the editors. Um, for your enhanced mark editor, right clicking your fields, right? You can uh, in your fixed fields and it gives you drop downs on some of those. Um, ability to tab between fields and your 007 uh, character wizard, which we will look at a little bit more later. Um, but that basically pops up a menu and walks you through adding those things. You can copy and paste whole lines. So uh, you need a 655, but just want to change part of it, copy it, change that part. You don't have to type the whole thing out. That's great. It's also uh, compatible with Mark. Um, and of course, have to get used to the slash for the placeholders and the OAs, right? Okay, so here's just a little, like, if you're not in cataloging every day, what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the wizard, that little out arrow is what you can click in the 007. It will pop up this physical characteristics wizard and it literally, you next and you choose from the drop down, and it fills it in for you. Thank Jesus for that. Um, as like the 07s and what order they were in and I, wow, wow. But don't do that, please. <laughs> your powers are needed elsewhere if you can do that. <laughs> so here's your, your, you know, your flat text editor. And I think this is the part that really scares like cataloggers who have been like maybe an OCLC the most. They're like, oh, oh no. <laughs> what's happening here and it's everything is slightly grouped together differently their spacing is is right so that's a little intimidating for newer catalogers coming in then i have that twice okay so formats and rules um what are special formats okay so 
if you have not read this uh, Unshelled, you should go and seek it out. It's kind of hilarious and has all the tongue in cheek library humor we love. But basically a special format is anything that is not a regular book. If it's a large print, that is special. If it becomes having plates, that makes it special. You want like the basic, get into special formats, cataloging. That's when you get into the, I put my pinky up, the fancy catalogers from like Moog who do music and scores and bless them. I don't know what a lot of that stuff means, but those are all the specialists of special formats. And as this lady shows, like our patrons would not know what that means, but they do know what that means. All right. So really the crux of when you're starting to catalog a special format, right? And evergreen is your, your type. It comes down to your type. And of course, it's one of those great menus where you can right click and you get the drop down menu. Now, of course, your A there, your book, put that D in for, you know, large print format, it becomes special. But look at all the choices we have there. Notated music, manuscript, notated music. I don't even think Missouri Evergreen has anyone who uses those. If they have, they have not asked me about it and they know how to do it. Um, but maps, video recordings, audiobooks, music, it, you know, it runs the gamut. Globe, anything 3D. And we're just going down the list. 2D. I get the, probably the most question about kits. Um, just dramatic sigh. What can you say about a kit? A kit is anything you want to put together and put make into a kit, um, but it also can be bought, and, but we punt and do the best we can. Um, so rules and best practices for special formats. Where do you even come across or find these rules? Okay, so you can go to the task force professional organization and your expert. So you're going to have OLAC. You're going to have Moog, like a Game of Thrones table, and they're talking about playaways and like throwing things at each other. Maybe not, but they are actually deciding the rules. Now, whether or not we follow those rules, we'll talk about because their rules versus public library rules are slightly different. But then I really, I always go out to shout out if you're from either of these places. I go out and look at other canoeing because that's generally more helpful to my catalogers than what the academics are doing. That's not helpful. Um, so these all will link out the slides well when you have access to the slides, but for now, we're just gonna kind of click through. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about catalogers judgment. So we know where we find the rules and who makes these rules, but like, what is catalogers judgment? This we say, if I was uh, doing roller derby, this would be one of my moves is the catalogers judgment. But so what can you massage in a mark record, right? There are certain things you don't have to do this, right? I always put my pinky out. That's the highest level of cataloging that's the most correct, but public friends understand and need it. They don't need to know a lot of the things maybe academic or law librarians do, right? So the usage of certain subfields, the P and the N, that's very squishy. Those are repeatable also. So like in a comic book, what's the part and what's the number? Does it have multiple parts? Or is that really the B field? If you ask, that's catalogers judgment. And that's what you say so they don't fight. It's catalogers judgment. It's fine. Uh, what else can you use catalogers judgment on? Uh, the 516. Some of the five are note or do the uh, most correct thing and make it like a 775. It's included. It's in there. That's catalogers judgment. And of course, the usage of 655s. Now, the 655s are fantastic. One of my favorite mark fields. However, the thesaurus is huge. Okay. So you can abridge that thesaurus on something. How many people know what that actually means? I mean, some, but would science fiction and speculative fiction work much better for them and convey the same thing? Why not put all of them, right? So those are some things you can kind of massage when you're looking at these. Okay, and of course, there are definitely places you absolutely cannot use your catalogers judgment. So your fixed fields, your 06, your 07, your 08, your 07 will control your icons, your 08 can control searching, you don't do it, don't argue. The 3XX fields, uh, as more libraries get towards RDA and actually using those fields, um, the content and the media type, that's important, don't mess with those, it is what it is. And anything that has to really do with accessibility and like DVD, and I have subtitles in French and it's also dubbed in Spanish. That will go in the 041 and also the 546, but you wanna include that. That's accessibility for your patron. Maybe they don't speak English and they need the dubbing, right? That's important. And they're telling you uh, what system it can be used on. I think that automatically goes to video games for me. So whether it works on a Wii or an Xbox, makes a big difference. Those are not the same, they're not interchangeable. And if the person wanting the Wii game gets the Xbox, Okay, so templates. Um, I started looking at wanting to do templates because the templates we had in Missouri Evergreen when I started were literally like three things long. And while that can be kind of helpful for somebody who is like up here at professional level cataloger, uh, we don't have century plus libraries with about five migrating in this year, 200 plus branches. Um, so I deal with basic and advanced catalogers all over the state. You may have somebody who's a director and is literally doing all the director things who also happens to be the cataloger. 
And you may have somebody like a professional level cattle leader, right? So those three fields, not, not helpful for us. We needed something more like choose your own adventure templates. Okay, so templates and evergreen also, when you're thinking about making templates, if you're going to make templates, there's certain things you need to think about. How many, how to load, how to use, and then I'm gonna show you some examples too. So, so how many and which templates should I create? Well, what types of materials are available at your library? If you don't have globes, why would you make a globe template, right? Uh, but you're going to have a lot of, you know, audiobooks, obviously DVDs. So I specifically made later when I made a DVD template, I made a DVD TV template and I made a DVD movie template because they're different. The fields are different enough where I wanted the language to be what it was two templates, right? So will your catalogers use templates? Catalogers are stubborn people. Um, I, there, I won't. And they may actually, if you have centralized cataloging and have professional level catalogers, three or four, they may not need templates. Let's be real. Maybe they would like them for convenience, um, but you know, you may not have anyone who uses them. So why waste the time to do it, right? Um, how many catalogers will be using the template, or do you have a group like I do, where I have some with you know skill level here, skill level here? What kind of language can I put that I know everybody will understand? And that goes to question four, the experience again. So, how do I create and load templates in Missouri Evergreen? Well, currently you can't unless you have access to the server. It has to be done in XML and it has to be loaded into the server. So that's kind of a trick question. Can I create them? Absolutely. Like Equinox, shout out to Dale for sending 500 emails back and forth with me to get these loaded, but that's how you would get them loaded. So if you, how can you load them? Do you have access to your server? If you're like hosted in house and you're doing that on your own server and have them load them. Can't I just send somebody a mark record? No, I wish. Um, they have to be in XML format. So I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like in a little bit. But if you're not used to seeing a template like that, the first time you see one, my eyes cross and I thought, what have I gotten myself into? Maybe I shouldn't do this. So you make your first template, they're all going to be the same, right? They all have such similarities, but it's getting over how scary it seems at first. Okay. And then really when you're done, how do you find, use, maintain whatever your templates? So like, can I peep slash test my templates? Absolutely. They generally are loaded in your test server so you can look at them and have the 500 emails with Dale who gets sainthood um, so that he can correct any errors that and it mattered, right? Um, and then of course, where do you find them? Um, it let, you go through all this work to load your templates and then you don't know where to find them in your tabs. That's not really helpful. And then how do you encourage cataloggers to use your templates? Again, we're a stubborn people. Um, I really have just been like, this makes it easier for you. It makes it easier for you. And then talk are the better the catalog is in general, right? But really to get the catalogers to use it, easier, easier. That's what they like. And then what if you need to update a template after production? You would do it the same way. You would update your XML and you could give it to either in the email to Equinox and say, large print books has become controlled 655.7. I need to change that. And they would update it for me. Okay. So a book template is not, as we said, a normal whatever book template not special, but I want to show you what this looks like in XML. And when I first saw this, I was like, oh, I wrote HTML about this much in grad school. Um, in XML, it's like, what is this? What it, just what's happening? That was slightly terrifying. So this is the top of a book record only to the 337 in XML. So there's a lot in there. Um, since you have to put your data field and all the other, let's call it gunk, because I don't know what it's actually called. It takes up a lot more space than your mark would. But once the magic happens and your Dale gets it lo loaded, that's what your template can look like. And you'll see with mine, I have some things that are non-standard in my templates. So like in my plain book template, X's, but I kind of left those there and X means you need to look at this, something is amiss and or delete it, but it needs to be filled in. I couldn't make things red, I wish I could, but that's how I chose to do that. So the book template is relatively you know, straightforward. Then you get to an audiobook template. And oh my, does it get bigger? That's why I suggest if you're going to make templates, start with the book and work your way up. But see, 300, and this isn't even the end. There would have been one more to get the entire audiobook in XML in here. And then what does that translate to? I mean, all of that condenses down. And then here is my choose your own adventure mark record. And you'll see, like, again, my X's. But then I also have audiobook and children's audiobook. And right, we know we don't need both. But so I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. Depending on who your catalogers are, you might not have to do that. You could maybe just put the 655 beginning of the tag. They would know what that means and do it. Okay, so more examples of templates. All the templates I ended up making, 
I ended up making because we don't deal with like several things. So I made, these are all linked out. So when you get these slides, you can actually look at all the templates I have. Please feel free to steal them in the book, DVD, Blu-ray. And as I said, for DVD and Blu-ray, I made DVD movie and DVD television series because those are different enough in the 500 fields and the 655s that I wanted to cut down on the catalog or thinking. Don't think about it, just fill it in. Of course, your cereals. Oh, and I left some of, I left my um, stuff that's not even supposed to be there. Cereals, I didn't talk about them. Okay, so cereals, I do, because although we discourage that, just having a single issue on its own records, we have libraries that do that. And then we also have a cereal if you're bringing in just Vogue and then putting them on like a regular cereal or a newspaper. So I had two for those. Play Away, made a spe specific one for Play Away because we wanted all of the, you know, the good teach patrons. This is how it's worded. This is how you look things up. The same with Vox Books. I'm new to Vox Books. I did not know what that was um, until probably a couple months ago. And I was like, oh, it's Teddy Ruxpin as a book. Um, the jury is still out on that. The official jury, like your OLAC, your remove, they don't even know yet. Um, so I kind of punted and did what looked okay for now for that. And then of course your video games, microfilm, equipment, man, I didn't fill these in, kit, single magazine. Um, the ones that people actually have, people, my catalogers have problems the most when using them are still going to always be the equipment in the kit. I'm doing this every day that this pen I could catalog and make a 300 for. Uh, it's not the same as a book and it's hard for people to understand that. So those are the ones, even though they are very choose your own adventure, like the other one, the ones I get the most questions about. Okay, and we're gonna keep this hopefully coming up short and sweet. So icons, all of these things in your special formats and your formats control your icons. And icons are so patron facing and they're so concerned that that icon, which can happen or it's showing the wrong one, that creates havoc. So where are your icons coming from? Um, your fixed fields, a lot of time it's your type. There are other things, I have them listed out, but I wanted to show that. So CD recording. So when you're having your front end staff and your patrons and you're getting the 500 emails I do that says, this is a CD music recording, supposedly. It has no icon at all, or it's coming up as Lord knows, or your CD audiobook, DVD, Blu-ray. Those are two that often get mixed up. This is showing a Blu-ray, but it's actually a DVD. And then you have to go pull it from the shelf. It's a whole thing. But these are where these are actually coming from. And something when you're making your templates in your special formats to make sure you include an instrument. Your music score. I'm very thankful that Missouri Evergreen doesn't really have music scores. I haven't cataloged those in five or 10 years, and I'm not sure I could right now if I wanted to without lots of help. Um, are the ones that Missouri Evergreen uses. Yours could look different. Uh, so picture, map, software and video games, microform, equipment, games, toys. Now that's an interesting one because you get so many questions. What is this? And I have like a fishing pole. I, I know it's just the equipment icon. It could be anything. It could be the skeleton of, you know, whatever. And that the kit, it is actually. <laughs> so, and then the cereals and magazines. Missouri Evergreen actually has a special icon. We have a play away icon um, that we have made and it's for us. So we have that one. I didn't want to show you in case you got all excited, but they, you know, if you're host socialized icons. So we wanted a play away one and we had the official play away little guy. And that was also a question with Vox Books. Do you want a special Vox Books icon? What does that interfere with in your other formats? What will that look like? So this is just really a shameless like uh, slide of my dog because everybody I show a picture they're like where's the dog butt picture because he's a corgi and so there you go so I don't have to be asked. <laughs> there's the splutes um, recommended documentation of course uh, evergreen kind of walks you through tells you whatever you need to know um, if you multiple times a day I have two screens that's generally open on one of them continuously um, and then I always try to go back to the source right I'll go and look at OLAC and Moog knowing that those things don't necessarily apply to me in my evergreen catalogers but that's where I would be looking for, you know, best practices and information. So that was a brief touch on what special formats are and like how important they are and what they can control in Evergreen and more pet techs. Um, yes, I have four cats and a dog, so I, they don't get counted as that. So does anyone have any questions? What's your difference for Fox books? Fox books, we kind of hybridized and I can send it to you if you like, we kind of hybridized a play away. Um, and then what I found somebody else doing which was hybridized of a book. Should it come up as a book in the OPAC? Should it come up as a sound recording in the OPAC? I mean, you know, catalog, you're supposed to think, what is this thing first? But again, if you pick one of those up, 10 people are gonna tell you 10 different things because the audio is built in. Um, so I made it so the audio came up first. Um, so it has an audio icon and it's more like a play away, but not exactly. 
the icons are actually, those are the ones that we have. They, you can have whoever is hosting you create or use different ones for you. Don't ask me how, I just know it's possible because like I said, our playaway icon, which I love, um, is specialized for us. Not everyone has that in their ILS. Thank you. You're welcome. It was it was an XML, so <laughs> Rogan's going to have a comment. <laughs> um, the easiest thing to do is if you have a support provider and you want to send it, and we can turn that into XML. Okay. That's fine. Don't don't, don't, I, I would not recommend worrying about the XML. Okay, so creating Yes, this tag, this subfield, these indicators. So what we want from you is what you want from our department. We can take care of this. Yeah, so there's the XML. Um, Yes. Yes. Up on 500 times is the fixed fields, right? And especially how I want my fixed fields to um, maybe have an X in them so that my catalogers are like, an X is never a choice there. That should be replaced uh, in XML and Dale. And I had to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Generally, no. The, there's a caveat though. The ones that <laughs> seem to be the worst, regardless, kits and equipment. People are so flummoxed by kits and equipment, they forget any number of things, their own name, the punctuation they know goes there from every other field. Um, but generally, if they're just pulling up a, a like the large print mixes in it, it just depends that the more complicated it gets, if you give somebody a serial record, expect more X's were not taken out. They do get loaded into the server. So I think it's going to be a difference between like loading them for everybody and loading them for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, they're universal. Um, so they're loaded, they're available for everybody. Okay. Uh, now, consortium public policy, um, but what some consortia do is prefix ones that are specific for a library that they're short on. Uh, so my live underscore. Uh, uh, yeah. So I just got this question from Ron, who's somebody in our, and he was wondering if he could put one in for his, uh, he's a special microfilm collection, bless him. And he was like, I want these things in there so I don't have to type them out every single time. Uh, first, we would just put maybe Sykeston dash and then whatever he wants his template. Mm -hmm. Those are there, they live in there. For yours? Yeah. Are you talking about your type where it's like books and yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm wonder if somebody took them out on purpose if they're not used <laughs> yeah are you talking about on the market drop dropdown or available yeah. like search one um, yeah, like in the um, for greater you want? Hmm. My, can I ask for library? Uh, I have uh, Niagara. Niagara Falls? Uh, Niagara, um, the library in Niagara. Like, yeah. something's being suppressed. Oh. Because there are a few more than that. Mm -hmm. stock. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if I, would I put it together or something? Or add, like, I would have to check. I, I would put in a ticket and say, hey, can you help me out with this? Someone touched my stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Well, half the time, you know, somebody made a decision long ago. Yes. Perfectly reasonable decision at the time. But then you fast forward years later. Uh, Man, it's just doesn't give you the drop down. Uh, yeah. That can be figured out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that's okay. Any other questions? So, from the support perspective, mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly about like the interaction with you. Know, they said to 